from San Francisco, it's The Cube, covering VMware Radio 2019. Brought to you by VMware. Welcome to theCUBE's exclusive coverage of VMware Radio 2019. Lisa Martin with John Furrier in San Francisco, talking all sorts of innovation and this innovation long history culture at VMware. Welcoming back to theCUBE, Mornay van der Walt, VP of R&D in the Explorer Group. Mornay, thank you for joining John and me on theCUBE today. Thank you for having me. So I got to start with Explorer Group. Super cool name. Yeah. What is that within R&D? So the origins of the Explorer Group, um, I've had many roles at VMware and I've been fortunate enough to do a little bit of everything, technical marketing, product development, business development. Um, one of the big things I did before the Explorer Group was created was actually Eva Rail. I was the founder of that, pitched that idea. Ragu and uh, Ray and Pat were very supportive. We took that to market, took it to 2.0, handed that off to Dell EMC, the rest is history, right? And then it was, what's next? So Ray let me look at some special projects go and look at IoT, go and look at telemetry, and did some audits for him, and he said, all right, why don't you look at all our innovation programs? Because beyond radio, we actually have, there's four other programs, and everyone always, radio gets a lot of airtime and press, but it's really the collective, it's the power of those other four programs that support radio that allow us to take an idea from inception to an impactful outcome. So hence the name, the Explorer Group. We're going out there exploring for new ideas, new technologies, what's happening in the market. Talk about the R&D um, management style. You eventually got all these, and radio's one kind of a celebration. It's kind of the best of the best come together with papers and submissions. Kind of a symposium meets kind of a you know, success event for all the top engineers. There's more, as you mentioned. How does all of it work? Because in this modern era of distributed teams, decentralization, um, decisions around business, decisions on allocating to the portfolio, what gets invested, money, <laughs> spend, how do you organize? Give a quick minute to explain how R&D is structured. So obviously we have the BU's structure. Yeah. Well there's PCS, Ragu and Rajiv head that up and then we've got the Octo organization which Ray O'Farrell heads up. And the business units are innovating every day to get products out the door, right? And that's something that we've got to be mindful of because I mean that's ultimately what's allowing us to get products into the hands of our customers, solving tough problems. But then in addition to that, we want to give our engineers an avenue to go and explore and you know, tinker on something that's maybe related to the day job or completely off, unrelated to the day job. The other thing that's important is we also want to give, um, because we're such a global R&D, you know, our setup globally, we want to give teams the opportunity to work together, collaborate together, get that diversity of thought going. And so a lot of times, if we do like a hackathon, which we call a borathon, we actually give bonus points if teams pull from outside of their business units. So you've got an idea, well, let's make it a diverse idea in terms of thought and perspective. Bring in, if you're from the storage business unit, bring in folks from the network business unit, bring in folks from the cloud business unit. Maybe you've partnered with some folks that are in IT, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's very, you know, sometimes engineers will go, ah, it's just R&D that's innovating. But in reality, there's great innovation coming out of our IT department. There's great innovation coming out of our global support organization. Our SEs that are on the front line sometimes are seeing the customer's pain points firsthand and then they bring that back and some of that makes it into the product. And how, how much of R&D is applied R&D, which is kind of business unit aligned or, or somewhat aligned, versus the wacky crazy ideas go solve a big hairy problem that's out there that's not kind of related to the current product sets? <sighs> That's tough to put an actual number on it. Well, ballpark, I mean. But if I, if yeah. I just say, like, if I had to just think about budgets on that, it's probably 10 to 15% is the wacky stuff that's, you know, not tied to a roadmap. That's why we call it off-road innovation and the five programs that my Explorer Group ultimately leads, it's, it's all about driving that off-road innovation. And eventually you want to find an on-ramp yeah. to a roadmap, you know, that's aligned to a business unit or a new emerging, you know, technology. How does someone come up with an idea and say, hey, you know, I want to do this. Do they submit like a form? Is there a proposal? How, who approves it? I mean, do you get involved? How does that process work? So that's a good question. It really depends on the engineer, right? You take someone who's just a new college grad, straight out of you know, college. That's why we have these five programs, because some of these folks, they've got a good idea, but they don't really know how to frame it, pitch it. And so if you've got a good idea, and let's say, this is your first rodeo, so to speak. <laughs> we have a program called Tech Talks where it allows you to actually go and pitch your idea, 
get some feedback. And that's sometimes where you get the best feedback because you, you go and you know, present your idea and somebody will come back and say, well, you know, have you met um, you know, Johnny and Sue over there in, in this group? They're actually working on something similar. You should go and talk to them. Maybe you guys can bring your ideas together. Um, folks that are you know, more seasoned, you know, longer tenure, sometimes they just come up and I'm going to pitch an idea to X Labs. And for X Labs, for example, that's an internal incubator. There is like a submissions process. We want to obviously make sure that, you know, your ideas, the timing in the market's correct. We've got limited funding there, so we want to make sure we're really investing on the right, um, you know, type of ideas. But if you, you don't want to go and pitch your idea and get feedback, go and do a borathon, turn an idea into a little prototype. And uh, we see a lot of that happening. And some of the greatest ideas are coming from our borathons, you know, and, and it's also about tracking the journey. So we have radio here today. I've mentioned X Labs, Tech Talks. We have another program called Flings. Some of our engineers are shipping product and they've got an idea to augment the product. They put it out as a fling and our customers and the ecosystem download these and it augments the product and then we get great feedback and then that makes it back into the product roadmap. So there's a lot of different ways to do it and radio, uh, the process for radios, it's, there's a lot of rigor in it. It's like, it's run as a, a research call for papers, program. Right? Call for papers, it's, you know, there's a strict format. It's got to be, you know, this many pages. If you go over by one line, you're sort of disqualified, so to speak. And then once you've got those papers, like this year we had 560 papers be submitted. Out of those 560, 31 made it onto main stage. And another 61 made it as posters, as you can see in the room we're sitting in. I have an idea. Machine learning should vet all those papers. <laughs> I mean, that's funny you say that. We actually have one of our engineers, Josh Simons, is actually using machine learning to go back in time and look at all the submissions. So, yeah. idea harvesting is something we're paying a lot of attention to because you submit an idea, the market may not be right for it, or reality is I just don't have a budget to fund it if it's an X lab. So it's like a Google search for your kind of your indexing all Internally, the Internally, yeah, and sometimes it's, there's a great idea here. You, you merge that with another idea from another group or another geo, and then you can actually well go that's and important fund because something. because timing is critical, and early, most stuff can be early in just incubation, gestation period for that tech or concept could be in play because of computer and other new things, right? Correct. And, and do you actually have the time? You're an engineer working on a release. The priority is getting that release out the door, <laughs> right? So put the, put the idea on the back burner, come yeah. off the release, and then, you know, get a couple of colleagues together and maybe there's a borathon being held and you go and move that idea forward that way or it's time for radio submissions, get a, a couple of colleagues together and submit a radio paper. So we want to have different um, platforms for our engineers to submit ideas outside of their day job. And it sounds like the different programs that you're talking about, Flings, XLab, Borathon, Radio, what it sounds like is there isn't necessarily a, a hierarchy that ideas have to go through. It really depends on the teams that have the ideas that are collaborating and they can put them forward to any of these Correct. programs. Yeah. And one might get, say, rejected for radio, but might be great for a borathon or a fling. Correct. So they've got, they've got options there and there's multiple committees, I imagine, is that spearheaded out of at Ray's Octo Group that's yep. helping to make the selections. Tell us a little bit about that process. Sure, so that's a great point, right? To get an idea out the door, you don't always have to take the same pathway. And so one thing we started tracking was these innovation journeys, they all take different pathways. Um, we just published an impact report on innovation for FY19, and we've got the vSAN story in there, right? It was an idea, a group of engineers had an idea, like in 2009, and they worked on, or they worked on their idea a little bit. It first made to radio in 2011. And then they came back in 2013, and sort of the rest is history. You know, vSAN launched in 2014. Uh, we had a press release this, uh, this week for carbon avoidance meter. It was an idea that actually started as a calculator many years ago, was used and then sort of died on the vine, so to speak. One of our SEs said, you know, this is a good idea. I want to evolve this a little bit further. Came and pitched an X-Labs idea, and we said, all right, we're going to fund this as an X-Labs light. Three to six month project, limited funding, work on one objective, you're still doing your day job, move the project forward a little bit, then Nicola Rakat, um, our sustainability VP, got involved, wanted to move the idea a little bit further along, 
came back for another round of funding through an Labs Lite, and then GSS with their Skyline platform picked it up, and that's going to be integrated in the coming months into Skyline, and we're going to be able to give our customers a carbon sort of readout of their data center. And then they'll be able to you know, map that and get a, a bigger picture because obviously it's not just the servers that are virtualized, there's cooling in the, in the data center plant and all these other factors that you've got to you know, take into account when you want to look at your carbon footprint for your facility. So we have lots of examples of how these innovation pathways take different turns and sometimes it's team A starting with an idea, team B joins in and then there's this convergence at a particular point and then it goes nowhere for a couple of months and then a business unit picks it up. One of the things that's come out, Pat Kelser mentioned that uh, a theme outside of the normal product stuff is how people do work. There's been some actual R&D around because you guys have a lot of distributed decentralized operations in R&D because global nature. Yeah. How should companies and R&D be run when the reality is, is that developers could be anywhere? They could be at a coffee shop, they could be overseas, it could be in any geography. How do you create an environment where you have that kind of innovation? Can you just share some of the best practices that you guys have uh, found? I'm not sure if there's best practices per se, but to make sure that the programs are open and inclusive to everybody on the planet. So I'll give you some stats. For example, when radio started in the early days, we were founded in Palo Alto. It was a very Palo Alto-centric company. And for the first few years, if you looked at the percentage of attendees, it was probably over 75% were coming from Palo Alto. We've now, over the years, shifted that to where Palo Alto probably represents about 44%, 16% is the rest of North America, and then the balance is from across the globe. And so that shift has been deliberate. Obviously, that impacts the budget a little mm -hmm. bit. But, um, and the, our programs, like a Borathon, you can hack from anywhere. We've got a lot of folks that are remote office workers, you know, using you know, collaborative uh, tools. They can be part of a team if, if the Borathon's happening in China. It doesn't stop somebody in Palo Alto or in Israel or in Bulgaria participating. And you know, that's, that's the beautiful nature of being global, right? If you think about how products get out of the door, sometimes you've got teams and you are literally following the sun and you're doing handoff you know, from team A to B to C, but at the end of the day, you're delivering one product. And so that's just part of our culture. I mean, everybody's open to that. We don't say, oh, we can't work with those guys because they're, they're in that geolocation. It's, it's pretty open. This is also really an essential driver. And I think I saw last year's radio, there were participants from 25 plus countries. But this is an essential, not only is VMware a global company, but many of your customers are as well. And they have very similar operating models. So that thought diversity, to be able to build that into the R&D process is critical. Absolutely, and also think about, you know, when you go into Europe, smaller borders, countries, you deploy technology differently. And so you want to have that diversity in thought as well because you don't just want to be thinking, all right, we're going to deploy a disaster recovery product in North America, well I can fail over from, you know, East Coast to West Coast. You go to Europe um, and typically you're failing over from you know, site A to site B and they're literally three or four miles apart. And so just having that perspective as well is very important. And we see that you know, when we release certain products, you'll get you know, better uptick in a certain geo and then why is, it, why is it stalling over here? Well, it's, sometimes it's cultural, right? How do you deploy that technology? Just because it works in the US doesn't mean it's going to work in Europe or in APJ. How is your team involved in the commercialization? You mentioned vSAN and the history of that, but I'm just wondering, looking at it from an investment standpoint, of deciding which projects to invest in, and then there's also the, if they're ready to go to market, the balance of how much do we need to invest in sales and marketing to be able to get this great idea, because if we can't sell it, market it and sell it, you know, then there's obviously no point. So what's that balance like within your organization about how do we commercialize this effectively yep. at scale? So that is ultimately not the responsibility of my group. We'll incubate ideas like, for example, through an X Labs project. And you know, sometimes we'll get to a point and we'll work, collaborate with the business unit, and we'll say, all right, we feel this project's probably a 24 month project if it's an X Labs full. So these folks are truly giving up their day job. But at the end of the day, you want to have an exit. And when we say exit, what does that exit mean? Is it an exit into a business unit? Are you exiting the X Labs project because we're now out of funding? You know, think about a VC. I'm going to fund you to X, you know, to a particular point. If there is no market right. traction, we may, you know, sunset the project. 
And you know, so our goal is to get these ideas, um, select which ones we want to invest in, and then find a sort of off-ramp into a business unit. And sometimes there'll be an off-ramp into a business unit and the project goes on for a couple of months and then we make a decision, right? And it's not a personal decision, it's like, well, we funded that as an X-Labs, we're now gonna shut it down because you know what, we're gonna go make an acquisition in this space. And with the talent that's gonna come on board, the talent that was working on this X-Lab project, we can push the agenda forward. You get a lot of action going on, so you can move people around. Exactly. Kind of like the cloud, elastic resource. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then some of these things, um, because X-Labs is only a two-year-old, you know, we haven't had things exit yet that are, you know, running within a business unit that where you're seeing this material impact, you know, from a revenue point of view. So that's why tracking the journeys is very important. And, you know, stay tuned, maybe in about three or four years, we have this a similar, you know, interview and I'll be able to say, yeah, you know, that started as an X lab and now it's three years into the market and look at the run rate. So of those 31, uh, last question for you, those, of those 31 projects that were presented on main stages, are there any that you could kind of see early on, ooh, you know, those those top five, anything that really kind of sticks out, you don't have to explain it in detail, but I'm just curious, can you see some of that opportunity in advance? Absolutely, there, there, there's been some great papers up on main stage and covering, you know, things on the networking side, there's a lot of innovation going in on the storage side. If you think about data, right, the explosion of data because of edge computing, what, how are you going to manage that data? How are you going to take, you know, make informed decisions on that data? How can you manipulate that data? What are you going to have to do from a dedupe point of view or a replication point of view because you want to get that to many locations quickly? So I saw some really good papers on data orchestration, manipulation, get it out to many places so you can take an informed decision. I also saw great, uh, there was a great paper on, um, you know, you want to go and put something in uh, AWS. There's a bill that you get at the end of the month, right? Sometimes those bills can be a little bit frightening, right? You know, how, what can you do to you make sure that you manage those bills correctly? And sometimes the innovation has got nothing to do with the product per se, but it has to do with how we're going to develop. So we have some innovation on the floor here where um, an engineer has looked at a different way of basically creating an application. And so there's a, there's a ton of these ideas. So after radio, it doesn't stop there. Now the idea of harvesting starts, right? So yes, there were 31 papers that made it onto main stage, 61 that are posters here. During that review process, and you asked that question earlier, and I, I apologize, I didn't answer it. You know, when we look at the papers, there's, there's a team of over 100 folks from across the globe that are reviewing these papers. During that review process, they'll flag things like, this, this is not going to make it onto main stage, but the idea here is very novel. We should send this off to our IP team. You know, so this year at radio, there were 250 papers that were flagged for further follow-up with our IP team. So do we go and then file it? an IDF and invention disclosure form, do those then become patents? You know, so if we look at the data last year, it was 210. Out of those 210, 74 patents were filed. So there's, there's a lot of work that now will happen post radio. Some of these papers come in, they don't make it onto main stage, they might become a poster, but at the same time, they're getting flagged for a business unit. So from last year, there were 39 ideas that were submitted that are now being mapped to roadmap with across the BUs. Some of these papers are great for academic research programs. So David Tenenhouse's re research group will take these papers and then you know, evolve them a little bit more and then go and present them at academic conferences around the world. So there's a lot of like, the what's next aspect of radio has become a really big deal for us. The potential is massive. Well, Mornay, thank you so much for joining John and me. And we've got to follow X Labs. There's just a lot <laughs> of really, really innovative things that are so collaborative coming forward. We thank you for your time. Thank you. For John Furrier, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching theCUBE exclusive coverage of VMware Radio 2019 from San Francisco. Thanks for watching.